If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. I want you to imagine for a second that there is a massive throne sitting right here in front of me, like where a, a king would sit in his palace, like, like just imagine a throne. You got that in your mind, right? So, so right here, there's a throne sitting here, and then I want you to imagine that Jesus himself was sitting here on that throne, like in person, that same Jesus yesterday, today, forever, he's sitting right here. How would the atmosphere in this room change? Like would we, would we be sitting there kind of half asleep looking at this like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know, like. No, right? We, we would see Jesus like this. We'd be in our faces in awe and wonder. We would be just overwhelmed. Humility and brokenness would come out of our hearts. We'd have joy and worship. We'd be crying. We'd be singing. We'd be all the things, right? Let me fill you in on a little secret. You don't have to imagine that because his presence is right here among us, just as if he'd be sitting right here in front of us. And so the question we need to ask is why don't we respond like I just described if that's true? Well, I think part of it, part of the reason many of us look bored at church is because we have this picture of Jesus in our heads where we see Jesus as this little figurine on a shelf that we can take down when we need him. But he's really not involved in our lives much else than that. And we see him as somebody we can control in essence rather than who he actually is. But, but think about that. How, how wrong is that? How wrong is that perspective of Jesus? See, my hope today is that through this passage in God's word, that you and I would see Jesus rightly. That he is this enthroned king over all things. 
Like for too long, I sat in church and just saw, I never saw Jesus like this. But that small vision of Jesus in my head for so long led me to make life all about me. Led me to think that I was some kind of self-made man. Led me to fall into the trap of lust, to sleepwalk through church and not care at all about worship in any way. That's what that small vision of Jesus led for me. But praise the Lord, he took the blinders off so I could see, finally see him like this. Which meant I finally saw myself in light of who he is, and that's what changed everything for me. That's why this theological vision of Jesus is so critical for us. That's why we need to see Jesus above all like this. Like, it's the whole theme of the series, right? Christ above all. This is where it comes from so that we see nothing else as ultimate than him. That's the goal. That we see nothing else as ultimate. My hope today is that each of us would walk away from this moment transformed. Where we would then boldly praise him in here, yes, but then we'd boldly live for him out there because of who he is. And to get there, I want to show you from this passage six essential truths about Jesus. Six things that, that would have distinguished Jesus from all the other gods in Colossae at that time, but about also things, truths that you can base your life on as well. That you can base today and forever on these things about who he is. So God, we pray as, as we look at this, I pray that you make us more like you through this. That you, you show us who you are. You show us more of the reality of, of being God and what that means. So thank you, God, for that. Help us, Holy Spirit, to see what you want us to see in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the first truth. The first truth is that Jesus is the perfect image. Jesus is the perfect image. Verse 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God. And verse 19 says further, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now this word image is used all over scripture. It's actually the word icon in the Greek language it was written in originally. And that word icon is familiar to us, right? It's, it's something to us that might mean a, a picture or a symbol on a screen that you double click to get to an app or something like that, right? It could even mean somebody that, that is a, a celebrity or somebody that's done some big things in their life. They're known as an icon of whatever they are, right? But here in Colossians 1, it means that which has the same form as something else. That which has the same form as something else. It's a living picture that corresponds to an original. That's why we see back in Genesis 1, 27, remember that, that, that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And what that means is that humans, you and I, were created to reflect God's character. We were a living picture of the original, that, that his nature was supposed to show up through us. It Kind of like a mirror reflects your image to you. That's sort of what the idea here is. God created humans to reflect him. Well, if you know the story back in Genesis 1, all the way into chapter 3, we made it that far, where Adam and Eve had done that for a while, but then they sinned. And what that led to is that every son or daughter of their lineage, including you and me, was then a tainted image, a distorted image of what God intended humans to be. And that was until Jesus, right, who, who was not of the seed of Adam, where Jesus instead was miraculously conceived in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. That was what he said was coming and 
fulfilled in Mary that was going to happen. Then he went on as that new seed, new lineage, that he lived a perfect image-bearing life. That's why Hebrews 1.3 calls Jesus the exact imprint of God's nature. You remember those old, uh, uh, the, you put a penny in there and a quarter and you crank the thing and it puts an imprint of some tourist attraction that you're at, right? It's an imprint. He is the exact imprint of God's nature. He was the most fully human person who's ever lived. But he's also the fullness of God, we saw in Colossians 1. Now, how can that be true, this 100% God, 100% man? How can that even be possible? It is hard to understand, but here's how Philippians 2 says it. It says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or to held on to for his advantage. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness or image of men. And so Jesus, as the perfect image, means he makes the invisible God visible. If we need to know what God's like, we just look at Jesus. He makes the invisible God visible, which meant for the Colossians, in the midst of all these other gods, that they could trust what Jesus was saying was actually good and right and true. That his way was right. They didn't have to find any other way. It's the same for us today. We, we can look at Jesus, fully God, fully man, and we can say, that is worth following. He is the perfect image. Here's the second truth about Christ. He is the principal creator. He's the perfect image. He's also the principal creator. Look again, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. He's the image of the invisible God. We already saw that, but he's the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, you may have already seen it throughout the book of Colossians. You're going to see things like that through him, by him, for him, in him. It just highlights this again, Christ above all. He's the point of this thing. This is so many times even in this verse. But notice a couple interesting phrases here. He says, firstborn of all creation. That's one of the interesting things here. Now, this phrase actually over history has been misunderstood by some to say that Jesus was created. Like firstborn son, right? Firstborn of all creation. But that's a misunderstanding of the way families worked back in the first century. See, when we take verse 15, not just by itself, but with verse 16, what Paul was saying was not that Christ was created in some way. He's actually saying that Christ held the primary position in the family, firstborn son was the leader of the future family, right? And so he's held the, the Pri primary position in the family. That's why I like the way the New Living translates verse 15. It says, he existed before anything was created and he is supreme over all creation. And we know that's true. We can't take just 15 by itself. We know that's true because 16 says, by Jesus all things were created. Through him all things were created. Same thing John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him, meaning the word, Jesus, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now you might be sitting there thinking about something, okay, well I thought God created everything. Yes, <laughs> because Jesus is God, remember? Right? This is the reality, the hard part of this, but it's also reality. But, but this is really cool, check this out. In the Old Testament, Genesis 1 Remember how God created. Did he have all kinds of you know, tools and resources and stuff? No, he spoke. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be plants. Like he created with this speech. But then listen to this. Psalm 33, 6 adds, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Now, do you remember what John 1 calls Jesus? The Word. 
by the word of the Lord. Even in Psalm 33, even in Genesis 1, the word of the Lord was the agent of creation. That is Jesus. That's the argument Paul's making here, that Jesus is the principal creator, that this God the Colossians were worshiping was all-powerful. They don't need to doubt that maybe there's going to be a competition someday between the gods that they're worshiping or choosing to worship, that Jesus is the all-powerful principal creator over all things. They didn't need to try and appease all these other gods for their security. They have the secure one who created everything. But shouldn't that lead us to take heart too, even today? Maybe we don't have the same context as they did back in Colossae, but, but we have a lot of other nations and threats. We have a lot of things that are seen, but also a lot of things that are unseen, that are pressing on us, that are coming at us, that are worrisome, that are risky, that all these things are coming at us just as much we can take heart because Jesus is over them all, just as much today as he was 2,000 years ago. He is over them all. He's the principal creator, so everything comes from him. And so it should give us some confidence, but it should also remind us of this. It should remind us that Jesus is Lord over not only our spiritual lives, he's also Lord over our material lives. Here's what I mean by that. You can't separate Sunday morning from Friday night. Like he's not just Lord over of your spiritual growth on Sunday and you, you give him his due, check the box and move on. No, he is Lord. If he's the creator, he's Lord over every little corner of your material life too. He is principal creator. We keep going, truth number three about Jesus. He is the pre-existing sustainer. He is the pre-existing sustainer. This is verse 17, now look at this again. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So here Jesus being before all things could mean either that he preexisted or that he ranks first above all things. Yes. <laughs> Again, right? Paul, for Paul, these things go together. That they don't separate that Jesus does have precedence in time, that he did exist before everything, but he also has precedence in rank, that he is before all things. He's in first place. It's what John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. It's just like Genesis 1, 1, the same kind of language that Jesus has always been. He's preexisted and so he could create. But here's, in verse 17, there's a next phrase. It's really interesting. He says, in him all things hold together. That's why I use the word sustainer. Because here, Paul says it's Jesus who holds all of creation together. Hebrews 1.3 says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Right? This is what it says about Jesus. Now, yes. While Jesus was here physically for 33 years on earth, he had to drink food, drink, drink, drink food. <laughs> he had, some of you do, I guess, right? We drink food. Um, what was that stuff called, Ryan? I can't remember. <laughs> Soylent, that's what it was. Uh, <laughs> so he had to drink water, he had to eat food. He had to take a nap, even in a storm on a boat, right? And yet, Philippians 2 says he was in the form of God, and so he had to temporarily set aside some of those things to identify with us, take on flesh, but you can't distinguish him humanity, Jesus, from God, Jesus, because as God, if he existed before anything else, that means he doesn't need anything. We can do nothing and bring nothing to him that would provide anything for him. He doesn't need anything as God. In fact, he's the one who sustains us. 
people in Colossae would worship all of these other gods by bringing food to a shrine or bringing food to a temple. You can see it in India right now. You can see these things. They're worshiping by saying, I got to provide for this God. That's a pretty, pretty feeble, weak God if you have to feed him. But listen to what Paul writes in Acts, or what he says in Acts 17 to the Areopagus in Athens, he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So whether you acknowledge it or not, you woke up today because Jesus said you're waking up today. The earth is spinning through the galaxy today because Jesus says it is. Rain and crops, intelligence, athleticism, it all comes from him. You didn't come up with it yourself. It comes from him. And so when we think that way about Jesus, clearly that's not just a little buddy on your shoulder. That's not a little figurine on the shelf that you can take down when you need him and leave him up there when you don't think you need him. No, Jesus is the pre-existing sustainer of all of life. Should that not spark in us a little bit of fear that we ought to avoid trying to be the sustainer of our own lives? That we think we can make this thing continue or we can stop or we can do whatever to make our lives continue? We should, we should be afraid of taking that away from who can actually handle that. But it should also spark in us a, a sense of gratitude that everything we have, even our very breath, is from him. Praise him for it. He's the pre-existing sustainer. Jesus is the pre-existing sustainer. Here's the fourth truth. Jesus is the peerless head. He is the peerless head. This is verse 18. Again, I'm reading through it. Just that we read earlier, reading back through it. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Now here's where you need to understand a little bit of the context of what Paul was writing in. For those original hearers in their Greek context, when they heard the word body, they would have immediately thought of creation. They thought of creation as a of body, and maybe even Zeus was the head of it, but they, they kind of had that picture of creation as a body, and, and when Paul then adds Christ as the head of the body, which back then, the word head didn't just mean directs it like a brain does, it meant source or origin. So when Paul adds Jesus as the head of the body, they would have thought, just like the previous couple verses, that Christ is the creator. Yeah, that that would have matched in their head to say, of course, yeah, that, that fits with the previous verses. Christ is creating and originating everything here, yes. But then he flips it on its head by adding that qualifier, the church. Again, it wasn't just the creation. Christ is the head of the body, the church. So what was he doing here? Why did he take it out of the realm of creation and put it into the church? Well, I believe he was playing off of this new creation idea that the church is intended to be. That Christ being the head of the church means that Jesus, hear this, he is originating a new humanity, the church, that we are to be, the church is to be a redeemed society that looks completely different than the rest of humanity. Do we see the church like that? Do you see this church as God does, that it is intended to be a countercultural way of life? That it is intended to be something different than the world, or is church merely an accessory for you? Like, if this is who Jesus is, 
If this is who he's intended us to be, if this is what he's intended us to be, then we cannot just show up when it's convenient. We must deeply commit to to relationships that would be life-giving and transformative for us. We must commit to serving one another like Christ commands. We must commit to giving generously so the gospel goes forth and we provide for brothers and sisters. We must commit to seeing this as a countercultural way of life, not just something we can do on Sundays when, we, when we're home. Right? This is who it is. If Jesus is the matchless head of the church, then he's worth everything for it. He's the peerless head. It's not just another club. It's not just the same like any other group of people out there. The church is intended to be a new creation. Here's truth number five. He is the preeminent resurrector. The preeminent resurrector. I just read part of verse 18. Here's the rest of it. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. There's a new phrase here that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now, we've already seen the word firstborn before, that that he is ranking first, right, in in all things. Here, he's ranking first in resurrection. So what does that even mean? Like, why does resurrection point to his preeminence? Why does resurrection highlight that Jesus is the first place in everything? Like, how, how does that tie together? Because no one else has ever done it. No one else has ever done it. No other God died and then defeated death by coming back to life to save people. He's the first place in it. That makes him the most important in this, right? He's the firstborn from the dead, which makes him preeminent. Because again, remember, the Colossian Christians were being presented with a buffet of religious options. And there was all kinds of things that they were were sampling from potentially or they were being tempted to pull from. They were being tempted with this buffet like you go to CC's, right? And there's all kinds of options. You can stuff yourself with this and that and this and that. They were seeing that in their own lives. But the reality is that no other God had ever done this. So when they're seeing this buffet this would save, or that would save, or that would fulfill, or that would satisfy. Where they're seeing all these things come, Paul's reminding them here that there's only one who's gonna do all those things for them. There's only one who's gonna satisfy, one who's gonna fulfill, only one who can actually save. And his name is Jesus. He's the preeminent resurrector, the firstborn from the dead. By the way, if Christ has not been raised, then we are all most to be pitied, and we are hopeless in everything. That's why this is so important, that Christ did come back from the grave, because that means we're able to be saved from our sin and have an eternal hope someday. See, because he has resurrected, we do have hope. That means we have this reality of Jesus, not just in the grave somewhere that we're venerating and honoring with icons and things like that. No, we're worshiping a king who sits on the throne over all things, which one day he's going to come back as he promised. That's who we're worshiping. He is the preeminent resurrector. And so listen, we've got five truths that are really pretty amazing already. (laughs) We could stop there and be good enough. But what Paul did with the rest of this passage is he drilled down to make it even more personal. See, he said that Yahweh is not merely an uninvolved deity. He's not just a God out there doing these things. He wants a relationship. And that's the sixth truth, is that Jesus is the proclaimed reconciler. He is the proclaimed reconciler. Starting in verse 19. 
For in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister." So he's beautifully explained the the supremacy of Christ. And here at the tail end, he points it back to God's saving work through Christ to what that means for you and me and them forever. Because reality is that as God, Jesus satisfied the requirements of God through his death on the cross. And what that does is it begins to bring all things out of order back into order. Someday all of creation, but here we see certainly that includes sinners like you and me who are estranged, hostile, evil. He brings those things back into order. And listen, it's critical for us. I know people don't like hearing the bad news. We don't like talking about that reality. The the reality is it's critical for us to understand the depth of of our sin against God because that's the only way we really appreciate the good news of what Jesus has actually done. Here's how I heard it illustrated one time like this. If you come and see me and you say to me, hey, I was at your house the other day and a bill came due and I went ahead and paid it for you. I really wouldn't know how quite to respond I need to know something about how big that bill actually is. Like, was it a package that came and there was extra postage due and you you paid a couple bucks and you got the package for me? Well, I I would say, thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much. That was very kind of you. But what if it's that thing I was afraid of getting from the IRS saying that I owed hundreds of thousands of dollars of back taxes. And you paid that. See, until I know to say thank you or to fall at your feet and kiss your feet and say thank you, I don't know how to respond to you. Right? I... I don't know how to respond. I don't know how happy to be because I don't know how big the debt you paid actually was. Listen, Christians, we should be really, really happy (laughs) because we need to see this reality that Colossians 1 says, you and I are alienated from God. We are hostile to God. We are evil in our deeds from birth, every single one of us. And that's the reality that that Jesus, the eternal son of God, took on flesh and he lived a perfect life that you and I should have lived, but then he died the death on the cross, shed his forgiving blood to reconcile us. That word means the opposite of alienated. Alienated means kicked out, far from God. Reconciled is brought near as a friend. Why did he do that? He did that because we deserved it? No. He did that merely because he loves us. And listen, as a parent, I would do anything to save one of my kids' lives. I'd give a kidney, I'd give my heart, I would push him out of a moving, the the way of a moving train, I would do all of that, whatever it took to save their life. You multiply that by infinity, and that's how much Jesus loves you. And he doesn't just make us his friends and kind of like look past the sin and sweep it under the rug a little bit. He doesn't just do that. Did you see? He does all that he does in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. 
He is working that in you, believer. Do, do you believe that? Like, do, do you see this for you? Do you believe that if you are in Christ by faith, he is making you holy? He, that word means set apart, distinct, sanctified. He's making you that way. He is making you blameless. That word means unblemished. It means it's like you lived Jesus' life. And then he says, above reproach. That word means no charge can be made against you. In a court, you're not guilty. And hear me, I know you might not feel like that's true of you today. You might not feel that those things are true of you. And listen, I'm right there with you. The enemy loves to dredge up my past to keep me ineffective for him. He does that to you. He's maybe doing that right now to you in your brain. But hear me today, church. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If your faith is in Jesus as Lord and Savior, then all that he is covers all that you are. All that you've done, all your past, all that he is covers all of that, and nothing can separate you from his love. So stop letting your addiction, your past, your situation, your self-talk, stop letting that stuff keep you from experiencing and walking in his love for you. Stop defining yourself by what other people say about you. Stop defining yourself by what you even say to yourself. Stop defining yourself by how productive you are. Because the reality is that Jesus loves you infinitely no matter what. How freeing is that? That you don't have to walk around trying to get it from anybody else. You already have it. It makes me want to worship. It makes me want to sing his praises. It makes me want to proclaim his excellencies to anybody who will listen in my neighborhood or in the nations around the world. It makes me want to live a life that pleases him in thought and action because of what he has done for us. I'm mean, gonna love what Spurgeon said. He said, I have a great need for Christ. I have a great Christ for my need. This is who he is, church. I'm gonna invite our worship leaders to come out now. But I want you to hear me, church. Listen, because of who Jesus is, stay steadfast. Because of who he is, stay steadfast. Remember, he is sitting on that throne right now. He's ruling over everything. You don't have to wonder if things are out of control because he is in control and you need nothing else. He doesn't, he, you don't need anything else. He, he always gives what is good. He always gives what is best. You might not understand. We might be confused, but he always does it. And so that means, church, that means Christian, that means unbeliever, you can submit your life to him. You can abandon control of your life to him. You can prioritize time with him because you want to get to know him. You want to hear and feel and see and experience and taste and see that he is good. And you know why? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. He is the alpha and he is the omega, the first and the last. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Church, this is who Jesus is. If this is who he is, why do we fix our eyes on anything else? He is worthy of it. And so let's sing, stand with me now. Let's sing his glory to who he is and let's go live loud for who he is as well, church.